Welcome to Two Wise Girls, a Percy Jackson podcast covering the Greek mythology and how traumatized all these kids are. This is Shannon. Welcome to the episode that covers the chapters of Sea of Monsters with the first interactions with Luke on the Princess Andromeda. Um, feel free to give us a like, or that doesn't really work on here, does it? Give us a uh, rate the podcast, review it if you can, even if you don't like it, any kind of rating is good. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy the show. I guess the only theme I found mythologically with the chapters that we read for this was, as I told you on messages, that um, there's an anti-Aphrodite, like, low-key vibe to the myths that they chose for this one. Mm -hmm. Um, So the first chapter we read was them boarding the Andromeda, which Andromeda, like, Percy said is, you know, like they brought back his namesake, which Mm -hmm. I love that they find subtle ways to put it into like near the beginning of each um, of each of the books, because the first one, it was Medusa. That was Mm -hmm. kind of our first callback to Perseus. And so, yeah, Andromeda was after the Medusa episode because he uses the head to turn the sea monster that was attacking her city into stone. So Um, He already has it. And then she had been, um, she had been promised to her uncle as a bride and he takes him out with Medusa's head too. So um, the, the Aphrodite tie with that one though, is the reason that the sea monster was ravaging them was because um, Andromeda's mom, Cassiopeia, said that um, her daughter was prettier than Aphrodite. And <laughs> it, it always doesn't matter to the gods whether it's you bragging yourself or somebody bragging on your behalf. They're going to punish you anyway because you're the person that is supposedly better than them. They would. <laughs> I mean, I love that they included those little bits. They definitely fleshed Sally out so much more with stuff mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, there's still question marks on her parenting, even even with her being a little bit more positive in the show. Yeah. She's yeah, not... I, I, that's what I like about her, is that she's not a perfect person. That she's who, like, a mom like this would actually be if they had Percy when she was, like, 19. Yeah, I mean, when you have your kids young, you do a lot of growing up with them, and sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's to their detriment, but um, yeah, I think they they definitely give the feel that she's aged up in this one too, so um, they're kind of, I guess they're correcting for that in a way. I think you mentioned this last podcast episode, but there was like some back and forth about whether or not Tyson was going to go with them because of where they were headed. I think that Tyson getting to choose for himself was great, but it also did give the feel that like, okay, now we can't wait anymore. So because he's saying he has to go and we hear the harpies, let's take him. Yeah. And well, the thing I like about that too is Percy being like, if we don't take him, he's going to get punished by camp because, you know, we're gone. Yeah. And that's that's definitely true. They would have taken it out on him and they already don't like him. Who that honestly who knows what they would have done to Tyson. Yeah. If they if they like if he stayed behind. And so it's like a thing of like I'm not going to let him get in trouble because of what we're doing. So even if you don't want him to come, he should he should he's going to come with us like period. And that's a, that proves to be a very like good decision very quickly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it does. And I love that the hippo can't be love him, that they're just like that the one rainbow was bonded to him immediately. It was doing tricks for him and stuff. Rainbow comes back multiple times for many books with Tyson. And so I was like, oh, hi, I remember you. (laughs) Like, I'm glad you're back. Yeah, it's so cute that it's like doing flips and and that um, the little note that Poseidon must have sent that one just for Tyson because it's a little bit bigger than the rest of them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, there's not too much substance to the hippocampi other than, you know, they pull Poseidon's chariot. <laughs> yeah, um, I I saw on Theoi and I... I love and hate Theoi at the same time because it's a site that people use that's pretty much the Wikipedia equivalent of 
Greek gods. And I know I haven't talked about, I've talked about this with you, but I haven't talked about it on the podcast. It's, it's a step up from Wikipedia because it'll take excerpts and like actually write them out, but it doesn't always give the context of them. So when I was looking at the listing for Hippocampi, um, there was a selection from Jason and the Argonauts but the context wasn't fully there. So I don't know what part of the adventure to the Golden Fleece it it was actually in, but possibly this is also a callback to Jason and the Argonauts going to get the fleece. Cool, I like that. I like when he puts in little things like that, that if you know the myths, then it helps you understand what's going on in the story. And if you don't know them, it's fine. It just goes over your head and you'll figure it out later. I, I think it's so fascinating too how the Greeks love these composite animals because we've had a chimera and now we have the hippocampi where it's like combinations of animals. The only other place that I've ever seen that depicted besides mythology is Avatar. You know, like they have the turtle yeah. ducks. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what is it? Legend of Korra. She has a polar bear dog um, that looks like a Labrador retriever. It's kind of cute. <laughs> I could say something about Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood right now, but I'm not going to. These chapters were, Jesus Christ, I was like, oh my god, these are so triggering for me personally. And it's also just so frustrating to read them. That yes. And I'm like, no wonder why I don't remember anything from when I read these books many times the first time, because my brain would have like deleted all of it because it would be too much for me between Hermes and Luke it's just like what I don't even know what to do about this like it took me so long to read the chapter with Luke because I kept having to stop because I kept getting like triggered so then I like take a break and then I come back because that's the only way I can like actually pay attention to what I'm reading when I'm reading stuff like that but it was just intense like I knew that the like the princess Andromeda stuff wasn't fun Mm-hmm. But I honestly didn't remember what it was like. And I definitely didn't remember. They don't know that they're getting on Luke's ship. <laughs> yeah. That they they have no idea. They have no clue. They just think that they're, they just know that Hermes sent them on this ship. And Hermes phrases it as like, oh, hey, by the way, if you run into Luke, like, you know, talk to him for me. If you, if you run into him as like, as like an add-on or something, not telling them that he's, trying to rush them to get onto Luke's cruise ship that they could have left another way and and like you know got Poseidon to like give them a boat or made their own or something and not have to take it that way yeah he led them directly to him yeah they're like they're literally little sitting ducks they have no idea what's going on they they know that the the cruise ship is weird like really weird to think about that there's like mortal normal people Mm-hmm. on the cruise ship that are just like i don't even know like um just out of it like i don't know the right word for how the state that they're in like almost like hypnotized and are just like reciting words like they're reading like a script or something but they obviously aren't really in control of what they're doing and it's like who are those people like why are why are they here and like who are they they can't possibly want to actually be there <laughs> so I- yeah, I, I get the sense that maybe they took over a normal cruise, maybe, and they just put some sort of spell over the people. Yeah. I don't remember what resolution there was for that, or if we ever see them again after this chapter. Yeah, I don't remember either. I know that the Princess Andromeda is Luke's ship for like the entirety of everything. And so I don't remember if they are able to get like the people off of it, because it's like, there's only so many things that they can actually do. And so they kind of have to like pick and choose, especially with Luke, like what they can do or who they can try to save. Um, But it's just more like concerning, I guess, in general for how they're doing things that they even have people like that on this like weird cruise ship that they've like some weirdly taken over. And I kept thinking like how awful this is going to be watching on the TV show, like watching them like get on the ship and not knowing what's going on and just kind of being like i don't know where there's literally nobody everywhere anywhere but we're here i guess we should sleep because we're exhausted because it's like 11 p.m right now (laughs) so like why not sleep okay and then like waking up the next morning to the overhead 
announcer person saying that there's disembowelment practice because the disembowelment practice is people practicing how to disembowel children from Camp Half-Blood. That the, yeah. that the things have on like your shirt yes. that they're practicing on. And disemboweling somebody is probably one of the more painful, like long lasting ways for somebody to die. Yeah. And they're teaching humans that they have with them and also monsters to kill people that way. And considering that monsters keep attacking camp, it's like, oh my God, that's like how, that's how brutal Luke is with teaching the people in his army how to attack literal children mm -hmm. that all look up to him. It's just, it's like, okay, this is really bad. <laughs> and it, it's just like really like scary of just imagining them stuck on that ship. And especially it's just so enraging that Hermes didn't tell them. He could have just said that's Luke's ship because mm -hmm. if, if he could have said it and they might've ended up going anyway, like what they do when they, when they realize that Luke is on the ship, that Annabeth and Percy are like, well, I feel like we have to at least try to figure out what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And it, so they might've ended up deciding to go and at least they would have known what they were going into. But the fact that Hermes doesn't tell them a single thing and they just end up in this situation. Last time I was like, why didn't Hermes ask Chris Rodriguez? It's because Chris Rodriguez is on the Princess of Dromedo already. I didn't yeah. remember that, but I was like, oh, right. The, these chapters do a good job of like almost bringing everyone but Percy back down to earth of mm -hmm. like what Luke is actually doing, like how serious he is about all this stuff that like he's already recruited a couple campers to join him that Annabeth knows who Chris is, even if Percy doesn't know him well enough to recognize his voice. It's still like they're on the ship where he's treat he's teaching people how to kill them all. Yeah. Specifically campers, specifically them. And is like just stuck there, like, okay, what what do we even what do we even do now? Like it it made me want to like murder Hermes when you see like when you the part when Percy hears luke's voice for the first time and he just like freezes and it is like shit like and doesn't even know what to do because he's just scared yeah and i'm like fuck you guys <laughs> like making him go and be around the person who scares him the most like knowing that how scared he would be of luke and just making him be around him anyway without even giving him the information for, like it's it's that whole thing of you, he should be able to know. Tyson is literally like a literal lifesaver in mm -hmm. these chapters. Um, I, d I don't remember it being that brutal the first time I read the books, but I don't remember anything about this stuff the first time I read the books. Yeah. But it's literally at, like when we get to like the end, it's literally like like Tyson does what he does. Like thankfully him and Percy have already have a good like relationship so they can understand what there's what he understood what Percy meant when he said like go but like if Tyson didn't do that they're gonna take them underground and have a that word that's like dragon but not dragon Drake Dracon or I think it's I don't know how to pronounce it right but they're gonna have that thing eat them I will say that it's very accurate to life how scared Percy is of Luke um especially the part when they're actually talking to him and he says that he's imagined all this time of like running into Luke again and being able to like yell at him and say what he wants to say and fight him again. But now that he's in person with him, he's just fucking terrified. Yeah. And it and is just shaking and doesn't know what to Yes. Yeah. Yes. That is like that is the like PTSD response. Like you get you can like believe that you can do all these amazing things when or just you imagine what you would do if you could have if you could have fought back or something mm -hmm. in your own head but then when you're actually doing it you're like no <laughs> i'm terrified of you my nervous system is going into overdrive and i don't even know what i'm doing um, i just kept imagining what it's going to be like on the on the show especially i was like trying i was like picturing charlie's face in like his super preppy clothes like luke is wearing like being like a very like i live on a yacht like kind of dude and just like picturing him especially the things that he's saying are just like out of this world 
Yeah. The first thing you hear Luke say is that he's happy that Chiron is like out of his position mm -hmm. and that he thinks that he'll never get his position back ever again um, because of Kronos being his dad, I guess, which is <laughs> it's just wild to think about Luke being the one to say something like that. Yeah. Like he thinks that he can, that he's using people's parental connections to like get them kicked out when he's a literal monster and is just getting away with it all because people think that his dad is nice or something. I don't even know. They, that's just, that's the only thing I can think of. But um, it made me think about how about how if if there are people at camp that were like getting Tantalus or somebody like that in there, because it's a very good um, strategy for Luke for to get people to join him. Mm -hmm. If somebody who's running camp right now isn't doing anything to help anybody, they're not protecting you, they don't care about you, and the person who does care about you is gone and is gonna like die, probably in Florida, um, and that's it. And so it's a very easy way for him to recruit people on his side if he just, because it's somebody being inept at camp. And so it's easy for people to think that they don't care about them when they literally don't care about them, <laughs> when the person at camp doesn't care about them anyway. Yeah. And I'm just, I, it makes me wonder if, if that is part of like what was going on there, because some of the, uh, some of the gods are on, um, and the Titans and whatnot are on Luke's side mm -hmm. in later books and stuff. And so um, you don't, that could have been happening at this point and likely was, we just as the audience weren't aware of it. We get such a huge switch up with Luke that it really is going to be interesting to see how Charlie plays it. Um, because, I mean, one thing you pointed out before is that a huge difference with how they did the ending scene in season one is that you know, Annabeth knows. Annabeth knows right away. And we have her not finding out until these chapters we just read where he is having that villain speech and saying shit like, oh, Talia would agree with me. Like, delusional. <laughs> and of course, Annabeth, who knows her too, is like, are you kidding? Um, no. <laughs> um, so it'll be interesting to see how this whole villain speech goes down because I can almost imagine it happening with Annabeth instead of Percy this time because mm -hmm. I mean she does get her quips in in the book but it would make more sense for her to be the one arguing like why the hell did you do that to the tree what the fuck is wrong with you yeah uh, because of yeah I, I I think a lot of the um a lot of the Luke interactions especially in this book are for Annabeth not Percy, because Percy knows who Luke is at this point. He knows that Luke is gone, that he's just an evil person, that he was pretending to be nice, but he was never actually nice. Everyone else is still trying to gaslight themselves about Luke. And so him being there, having to watch they like the most manipulative stuff in a row to him in a way that all abusive people do is horrible for his tiny little brain. And it makes me mad that, um, you know, that Hermes subjected a 13 year old kid to going through that but like he wasn't like shocked by it necessarily by any of that stuff with how he's talking about it even he's trying to like get through the 
like get through being on this on Luke's ship and he's trying to get whatever information he can and trying to get off of it while still being alive but he's not that's how he looks at it as soon as he hears Luke's voice he's like okay we're in serious danger now we need to figure out what we can and get the hell out of here before we all die but like people like Annabeth and the kids at like at camp that are still there that aren't here they're the ones that need to hear Luke literally being like camp is everyone at camp is going to be dead in a month um you're like a weak bitch for even trying to save them and just all the other things that he said like he literally i was reading this i was like did rick riordan meet my dad <laughs> like did he actually meet my dad <laughs> like i know he didn't but that the conversation with luke is exactly how interactions like that with really abusive people like that go and I was just like this is wild that he's getting this like so accurate where it's like hard for me to read it because because of how disorienting and confusing those sort of discussions are and like the whole Thalia comment of like oh Thalia would be on my side if she was alive like granted him thinking that is where we get one of the most iconic scenes that I'm so excited about seeing on the show where he's like, you don't have the guts. And then Thalia is like, fuck you and kicks him off of a cliff because, and she can do that because he doesn't, he's like, he literally tells her, I don't think you have the guts to kill me. And, and she's like, actually, yes, I do. <laughs> and, and they're, and like, they're all like disappointed. The only one that isn't disappointed is Annabeth afterwards when they, at the end of that book, when they found out that he somehow survived that fall. <laughs> but everyone else, like Thalia and Percy and stuff are like, damn it. <laughs> um, but there is, so that is funny in and of itself, but especially like the like the gaslighty stuff of like you're saying something and you're saying it where you sound like you are saying the truth you feel like a crazy person questioning you but there's absolutely no way what you're saying is actually true is like when he says that and then he tries to argue that annabeth being around tyson like a cyclops is somehow worse than what he you are literally killing her <laughs> like you are literally killing Thalia you are not only are you killing her you're killing her so you can kill a bunch of other kids that she probably still cares about and you somehow in your little brain have decided that her being killed by you or like her being turned into a tree by Zeus in the first place is somehow worse than you killing her right now so that you can kill everyone else she ever met <laughs> like and and are so sure about that that you'll say that to Annabeth's face and like some of the comebacks with Annabeth are great where she's like where she calls him stupid where she's like obviously you don't have any intelligence here you're a fucking monster yeah <laughs> like and so that's gonna be fun to watch her just be like what is are you like mentally deficient what is wrong with you it's like the characters in that scene are all having like a different scene like Percy is just like this is gonna be horrible I just want us to get out of here still alive and I know this is going to be awful and I'm terrified, but I just want to survive. And Annabeth is like, for the first time, probably really realizing just how bad Luke is and then tries to gaslight herself in later books to convince herself that he's not actually this bad. But that's very much like what's going on with her in these in like, especially this part of this book, especially mm -hmm. because Tyson is the one that saves them. One scene that I thought about with this show is when Tyson is using like his mimic thing to mm -hmm. say out loud, like who's talking in the next room. And that not only will that be like a cool scene to see in general, and yeah. it's the only way that they could ever know like what Luke is actually saying, or like knowing that he's like heard them and knows that they're there before he, you know, comes out to find them. So they're not completely surprised by him. But it's also interesting because Annabeth is scared of her of him being able to do that because that's what the Cyclops did to her when she was younger. But it's the way that it's presented in this book, it's very like a morally neutral thing. Like mm -hmm. Tyson doing that is not him being scary. He's not trying to trick anybody. He's literally just trying to eavesdrop on a, like a murderous maniac so that they can try to get out of here alive. And I just, I like when they do things like that of showing things that could be seen as just purely bad in, in like a different light. Because yeah, yeah, like there's nothing wrong with Tyson for doing that. Um, 
it's not an evil thing. It's only evil if the person who is using that skill is using it to hurt you, which is very much the kind of theme <laughs> with like Tyson, especially in this book with juxtaposed with somebody like Luke. Yeah, yeah, because we know from Tyson, at least, that there are monsters all over that ship. I mean, they only come in contact with two, which that's our other anti-Aphrodite story, is mm -hmm. Agrios and Aureus, I believe was their names. Um, mm -hmm. So their mom didn't, a Ace Aero and went to go be a huntress, but sometimes in Greek mythology, people who are too Ace Aero and like, talk about love in such a disparaging way, Aphrodite will punish them anyway. Mm -hmm. And so she got punished with getting attracted to some bears. And she has these giant children who the mythology says they don't fear gods. And so like we have those giants, we have the Lystragonians, who knows what else is on this ship because it's probably a huge cruise liner with like tons of monsters on it. Yeah. and. Yeah, that's all we see and all Tyson can say is it smells bad because, you know, he doesn't, I'm sure even if he knew exactly what else was on there, he wouldn't know how to explain it. No, I don't, um, the way they put it is like Tyson isn't old enough in like Cyclops years to be able to tell and that makes sense because he is, they are still all kids. Yeah. So it makes sense that he wouldn't, that maybe when he's older, he would be able to do something like that. But since he's also a kid, he can't. But it's also just the thing of him immediately just being like, it smells really bad on here. Something bad, something really bad is happening here. I love that Tyson gets so mad at Luke calling Percy stupid and a bunch of other names that he just attacks them. He like breaks a chair and just starts attacking them because it, he gets so angry, which like, that's how I feel when people are mean to my friends. <laughs> but it's still like, it's very sweet. It's like a sweet thing to he see how protective he is of him to be like, stop talking shit about my brother. I will kill you right now. The whole scene with Luke is so like disorienting because of all the different things that Luke is saying and how they like contradict each other. And like, I went back to try to reread some of it to try to remember everything he said, because it, I was like, there is just so much happening in this one little section <laughs> that I like, I'm like trying to like keep up. Um, but one of the things that is like, automatically like contradicts itself is he's he tries to make fun of Percy for Tyson being his brother he says that it's proof that Poseidon doesn't care about him yet at the same time he's in this room with Tyson where he's attacking people with chairs to try to protect Percy so are you really sure that he doesn't care about him because he just gave him a brother that is willing to attack anybody who's ever mean to him Mm -hmm. And then at the same time is also making fun of them for being around Tyson because he's a Cyclops and acting like he's bad and evil and less than because he's a Cyclops. But at the same time, he almost takes out the bad guys, the, the bear twins that he has, and they have to like use strategy to stop him so that Luke can like try to kill them without Tyson stopping them. And Tyson is the reason why they get away from Luke. And so like, are you sure? Are you sure that Tyson is like less than like you're trying really hard to convince them that Tyson is less than and you're better and smarter than but than them while well, Tyson is the one is the reason why they get away. So actually, I'm pretty sure that Poseidon actually does care about his his son in this instance. And that even if it's not something that makes sense, he clearly made that happen for a reason. And this was probably the reason. <laughs> And it's just one of those things of he's trying so hard to make it seem like he's so big and bad and like they always do. But when you have time to actually stop and think about what you're doing, which you absolutely don't have time to do that when it's actually happening to you. When you think about it later, you're like, oh, right, that doesn't actually make any sense. What the hell was he talking about? <laughs> and it's just to... To go back to stuff with Hermes, one thing I forgot about with Hermes that made me irrationally angry, well, it's probably rationally angry, honestly, is how he he gives Percy all of these like gifts for them to use on their quest. And he explains how to use like the wind so that they can get away. Like I read like a tiny bit of like the next chapter and it's literally Percy yelling at Annabeth to like strap herself into the boat because he's about to use the wind. and. If she doesn't strap like tie herself down she might just like fling out of the boat because of how much the wind makes them move um so they're they're gonna use it but it's also a thing of that whole thing is is way worse once you realize that the ship they're on is 
Luke's ship and that he didn't tell them about that is like he basically makes it impossible for them to say no because he gives them a bunch of gifts mm -hmm. and it's really hard to tell somebody no when they're giving you a bunch of stuff like this is a literal like people pleasing like tactic and and like people pleasing is manipulative you can get mad at me for saying that but it's not going to magically not be true <laughs> like and, I, and i'm someone who's done that before for many years i will admit it fully admit it because yeah. yeah i would do stuff like that i would try to like buy them gifts or do things nice with them when i thought that they would be mad at me because i knew that i was trying to manipulate them or do things that they didn't want to do and so it's easier for it's e it's way harder to have somebody be like here's all this free stuff for this quest i want you to go off and like talk to luke i don't want to talk to luke but you just gave me all of this free stuff and you gave us enough food and water and clothes and money to get through this entire quest which we wouldn't have had and they don't have on other quests when they don't have a god like manipulating them into going mm -hmm. so it's pretty much an impossible thing for them to not go i'm like thinking back to what i thought about hermes when i when i when we did like our first one of these when we just like went over the gods and i was like oh i like hermes and i'm like i want to stab hermes in the throat like <laughs> i i think i hate you now when they're like talking to luke and percy is like sitting there being like oh your dad wanted you to know this and i'm like oh my god this is just so horrible that this 13 year old kid is is like shaking and terrified and is like having to give like a message from this dude's dad because he's like making him be the one to tell him this stuff because he's too chicken to actually tell talk to his son himself mm -hmm. and it's just it's like the most ridiculous thing i've ever seen in my life that hermes is such a little bitch that he's making these kids do this stuff for him and put them in this situation like hermes isn't going because he knows it's like he's afraid of backbiter he knows he's gonna get freaking cut if he goes up to luke and it's like even though you know he's not gonna change his mind and if you went yourself he would attack you you're gonna send this mortal boy who's smaller than him like yeah. what what are we doing here yeah and especially like a mortal boy who was just attacked by him in recent times mm -hmm. and probably wouldn't want to see him again and also i'm pretty sure that luke wouldn't it's not a good idea for them to be in the same place yeah like especially because all of the gods know that percy is having nightmares from chronos of chronos trying to get him to be on his side and you know he has that dream when what he says is like the scariest dream he's had so far when they're on the ship mm -hmm. but when they wake up in the morning and of chronos doing trying to do things like that to him and percy is is you know an abused kid so he's not gonna fall into that stuff of somebody trying to him do what they want him to do mm -hmm. um but it is also a very stupid thing i would think to put him in a place like that where he is automatically in the line of fire of Kronos and Luke and all these monsters that would all love to like they would be so excited to kill specifically him yeah um a prophecy kid a kid of the big three yeah there's so many reasons why Percy has a target on his head and yeah like that's as these books go along it's kind of funny um that monsters will know like know him by name they'll say like his full name like perseus jackson and he'll be like what and like in like the later books they're like afraid of him where they like will sometimes will run away from him because he's killed thousands of them like that someone figured out the number it's like 5500 are like monsters like in the in like the later books like heroes of olympus there's a part when they go to alaska he kills like 1500 monsters in one scene oh my gosh and you're just like okay well yeah. <laughs> and like that's percy that's that's what he can do but yeah so it's like that's very much a thing that's happening already is they would love to be the one to be able to kill the prophecy kid and also kill a big three poseidon kid like that and and to just like kill any sort of like hope any of the other kids at camp or any of the other gods or anything would have had that this wasn't going to be this bad um 
Yeah, but with monsters already knowing his name, that's Kleos. That's what Kleos is supposed to be. It's supposed to be your name recognition gets you so much power. And so being the monster to take that person down, it's like you inherit that Kleos plus them, you know? The thing that I think is so funny about Percy's life is that he has all of that. He doesn't want it, though. Yeah. Like, he... He, like, just talking about the things that he does in his first quest, that he kills Medusa, that he gets away from Echidna, that he gets out of the underworld alive and, you know, survives the whole thing with Luke, um, is enough already that for most demigod kids, they would never, they wouldn't usually never experience all those things and also survives fighting Ares. Um, and that's just, like, the first book. And so he has, like, what you would imagine Kleos to be, but he doesn't care about any of it. And he doesn't think that it actually matters. Um, that's like one of my most fascinating things to think about, especially in the later on books with kids that are meeting him for the first time and have this idea of him that doesn't exist. <laughs> Is that if you hear about him offhand, you think that he would be like Jason or something, you know, this big, bad, like hero looking person who does everything for the good of whatever, whatever and like the god's little bitch and like kind of like how luke almost is talking to him like he is but he's not and he's not he's not like that at all but he's not actually like that at all yeah he does all these things but he also doesn't think any of that stuff necessarily matters it's like i do that because if i didn't do that i would die that's that's literally all it is like he doesn't think anything he's doing is necessarily like special or different or interesting or whatever he's just like i just have to do this because nobody else will and i also just have to do it and that's like the end of the story um <laughs> it's just one of those funny things of if you met him you would actually met him and talk to him you would never think that he is who he is until he started just he's that person that like offhand mentions things that he's done in the most like lackadaisical sort of way <laughs> the whole dynamic with him and luke is very much that like luke, luke is like that person that would literally turn into a crying little baby if he actually got like three percent of attention from his dad at any point in his life he would become the god's ultimate bitch if he actually got that he would literally do anything they asked because that's all he ever wants is to be seen as like the number one cool guy hero person who everyone loves and adores and he's so angry because he isn't that, and he thinks that that's the worst thing that's ever happened to anybody in his life, including him and everyone else he's ever met. But it, he, but like, it would make it probably makes him so mad that Percy gets that stuff. Like he sees his his dad more, his dad even like adopted basically or like claimed a, a cyclops to protect him on this quest so that he would make it make through it and all that but and is even though he's not technically there he's still doing things where he's trying to protect him more than hermes ever did towards luke and and percy like doesn't necessarily care like that and i feel like it makes him so angry <laughs> that percy gets that stuff that he always wanted and gets to go on all these quests but like percy doesn't want to go on any of these things and he doesn't want the extra attention yeah um and luke must be like but like luke would like drool if the gods ever offered him to be a god he would be like yes i'm gonna be the best god ever and kill everybody <laughs> he would have said yes like automatically like pretty much him working with chronos is him trying to be like a god by proxy like thinking that he can like be around a more powerful god and, and he can be the most powerful one yeah. um but yeah that's <laughs> It just makes me laugh thinking about that, that Percy has this stuff and he's like, I don't want it. You take it. Yeah. And it and like and Luke is like, nobody will even offer this to me, you annoying ass child. We got 45 minutes in before I mentioned Harry Potter, but this is <laughs> like, I feel like it's another thing that Rick did that I J.K. Rowling might have been trying to accomplish, but didn't do it as well, where I think this might have been something you pointed out as well in some of your Harry Potter videos that Harry has this inherent mistrust of adults because of his trauma. Mm -hmm. And Percy also does. But in Harry's case, we don't get the sense that the adults couldn't handle it if he went to them. And in Percy's case, we know that they wouldn't be able to handle it well. 
because they're all gaslighting themselves. So at least it makes sense that Percy has this mistrust of authority. Plus, because he didn't grow up in the Greek and Roman world, like the other kids kind of had to go to Camp Half-Blood a little bit earlier. Um, and because he actually had a loving mother, his expectations for what dynamics are supposed to be are totally different. And yeah, because he didn't really recognize that he was around monsters until he was 11, when he is faced with a monster that actually isn't isn't a monster per se, Tyson, he can see his powers as neutral. He can see like, oh, him being able to mimic voices is useful. Him being able to have this super strength is useful. When, you know, people like Annabeth who have experience are just like terrified of him, even though they shouldn't be. Yep. Yeah, and Percy has, it's kind of a miracle that Percy trusts anyone um because of just what happens with luke it's amazing that he trusts anybody at all luke was the first person in this world that befriended him and made him feel like he belonged and helped him figure out how everything worked and he's the reason why he even brought annabeth on the quest with him and all this stuff only to find out that all of that was a lie and he was trying to kill him the entire time and then it's honestly amazing that he trusts anybody at all after that um and it's, I think it's why he clings so hard to like Annabeth and Grover, because not only because they obviously love him and care about him a lot, but they're like the only people that he's sure that he can trust. Mm -hmm. um, and stuff with Annabeth definitely gets very difficult in later books with Luke, but that trust like never completely goes away. Like they, even when things are ridiculous with hard with them, and they're not really communicating very well, um, that trust is still there, that they know that they love each other and they care about each other. And he trusts that he can go to her with things and she won't tell anybody else what's going on and vice versa. But it's pretty much just them. Like it's, it's, it's hard for him to trust anybody at all because of how badly he was betrayed by Luke and things. It's no surprise to me that Percy follows like the abused kid sort of pattern where we don't have that many friends, but the friends that we do have, I will literally like kill God for you. <laughs> if yeah. you ask me to just ask me and I'll do it. That's not like a question. That's just how much I care about you because you're one of the few people I've ever met in the entirety of my life that has actually been there for me and cares about what I'm going through and hasn't like used that to do something, you know, to me or like try to get me to do something that I don't want to do and all that kind of stuff. He has other people that he's friends with and friendly with in this world, but I don't think anybody ever gets as close to him as those two do because it's just like, I think it's, it's just too much after something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yes. And also, Luke was so short that that's why I do think he's able to make this switch easier than other people of like, mm -hmm. oh, that was all fake. Um, you know, Annabeth had, what, six, seven years of gaslighting? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's the fact that he's new to him as much as it hurt him and as much as he really wanted to be like a long term friendship it's so much easier to accept because it was like, oh, we had a couple of months at camp and that's it. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the thing I was going to say about Luke during that interaction that it's just one of the wild things that he says is the part when he's like, I can give you everything you want. Um, like Percy, you'll, you'll be like rich, you'll be famous. Your mom will never have to work again. She can live in a mansion, Annabeth. You can be like an architect and you can get everything you've ever wanted. And Annabeth is like, please die. I'm pretty sure that's like her actual words to him saying that. But it's it's just the like the insane manipulation of that. Like that whole interaction with Luke is a really good way of describing what it's like to be around super abusive people like that in your actual life because they will come to you and they will be, and this is basically what Luke says in this scene you are shit. Everything that you believe is shit. You are pathetic. Your parents hate you. No one likes you. You're trying to save a bunch of people and it's not going to work. Why are you wasting your time doing this? You're pathetic. I'm so much better than you. and I'm not even trying, but also you should join me. 
after I just like stomped you into the floor and made you feel like a tiny like like speck of dust on the floor that just got stomped on, you should join me though after I just completely destroyed your entire like character and and are now going to be like the internal voice in your head when you think bad things about yourself. I'm going definitely going to hear your voice, but yeah, I'm definitely going to join you. And that's, but that's literally what they're like is they try to destroy like your entire sense of self and say the worst things you can possibly ever imagine and even worse than you can possibly ever imagine about you. And then they'll turn around and be like, this is why I'm so mad at you because you just won't listen to me. So if you just listen to me and do what I say, then I'll stop telling you that your dad hates you and everyone at camp is going to be killed and you should just accept all of it. And it's just wild to hear him say all the stuff that he did before he got to that moment in, in that whole scene and then be like, oh, by the way, if you just join me, you can be rich or something. When I read that, I was like, yeah, the only, the, the price they would have to pay for getting all of that is letting everyone get murdered and knowing that that was going to happen and being fine with it and literally making money off of it. Mm -hmm. And, it, or I try to compare Luke to other villains because he does not fuck around. Was he manipulated? Sure. But also when you're willing to do things like this, you're, you're doing, you're doing this. Um, yeah. You're making these decisions to do this stuff. You're teaching your army how to disembowel children that all look up to you. The one line that that Percy says is such a good way to describe what it's like to be around somebody like him, where he's saying, like, every time I think that I'm getting, like, my footing, he says something else that, like, completely throws me off. You know, for some reason, I'm thinking of Buffy, and I didn't watch Buffy fully, but do you remember the arc where um, it was, like, the season where Dawn appeared and she has to sacrifice herself? Yeah. Like that feels like something Percy would do to me. It feels like um, this idea of like, well, if this is what's best for everybody, I'm going to do it and hope that everybody's okay. And honestly, a relief from all of this pressure wouldn't be the worst. <laughs> like, you know, like that almost comes to mind for me of how he approaches like these situations, especially in this show where we see him actively walking into situations where it looks like he's going to die. Yeah, that's very much what Percy would do, like is willing to do, kind of does do in certain situations. Like there's kind of a moment like that in almost every book. Uh, I saw this meme today that always makes me laugh of people being like, what would your, like the characters pretending like they're talking and being like, what would your last words be? And Percy's is finally. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah. yeah and like annabeth is like no <laughs> and like this and like the in like the meme of it she's like no wrong answer but i'm like no that would be his answer <laughs> you're like god okay that's fine now at least i can like relax about worrying about all, about this whole death thing for all this time like really positive thing i love about this chapter is these chapters is tyson that like Annabeth didn't want Tyson to come, but if Tyson didn't come, they would have all died. I don't remember how long her like distrust of him like lasts like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, the only reason she's hanging in there with him is because she trusts Percy so much and she's yeah. realizing, I mean, she realized from the moment before she let him into Camp Half-Blood that this Cyclops, for whatever reason, is that attached to Percy that he will do mm -hmm. anything for him. And so I trust Percy because Percy wouldn't let this Cyclops hurt me. I still cannot find a better comparison for Luke than Anakin. Like, yeah. the idea that, um, you know, he knows everything about this organization he's up against. I know, like, it's not necessarily the Jedi that he is up against, but he's up, up against the demigods. He's up against the um, establishment of Olympus, I guess. And um, he, yeah, he has inside information. He's had experience with these younglings that he kills because, you know, they're like, Master Luke, and, or no, sorry, Master Anakin, when he comes in, thinking he's going to save them. Um, and we saw that he was capable of that before he turned evil because of the sand people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, Star Wars is a good one for that because um, Kylo is very similar to that, where the whole backstory with Kylo is that they're at like the Jedi Temple of Luke's on whatever, I forget what planet it is, but he has, you know, the whole thing that they show us in The Last Jedi that happens where 
Luke basically gets scared in the moment that because he has like a horrible dream vision thing about Kylo killing everybody, he gets scared that Kylo's going to kill everybody. And so he thinks about doing like hurting him and then realizes that's so fucking st- what the hell am I doing? That's a very Luke Skywalker thing to like be impulsive in the moment and then like calm down. He does that often. And but of course, like Kylo wakes up and sees him doing it. And but like <laughs> The, the thing that I used to bring up in Star Wars arguments all the time, and I was like, did you know that when you see somebody in your room trying to maybe think about hurting you, that if your reaction to that is to not only try to kill them, but kill all of your friends, um, you're not in the right. <laughs> like, did you, did you know? The more you know. But, like, that was one of the funniest things happened in, like, Star Wars back in the day. I was like, do you guys realize that, yes, Luke made that decision, but if your reaction to that is to kill everyone, everyone that is around you then he's kind of has a point (laughs) because most of the time people who like aren't you know thinking about stuff like that they wouldn't react like that to something like that like they just they wouldn't see that as an option and so anyway kylo doing that um like killing all these kids that were there training that are his close friends he knows everything like han and leia are his fucking parents like Luke is his Luke is his uncle. He knows everything about everyone. He's connected to everybody. Every single thing he does like gives everyone great like psychic damage and just like pain because it's him doing it and he like loves that about it. <laughs> um but it's still like he knows everything about everything. He knows everyone personally and it's so it makes everything that he does so much harder to for them to deal with. And that's it's pretty much like that's why I hate I like refuse to watch The Last Jedi because that movie is just him manipulating Rey nonstop. And I'm like, why would I subject myself to this? Even though there's scenes in this movie that I really enjoy, um, I don't want I don't want to. But it's it's the same thing, but like sim- very similar to Luke, where Luke knows everything about everyone and he uses that to manipulate everybody and kind of gets off almost in the same way that Kylo does of knowing that the things that he's doing is hurting, like hurting them and making them so sad and leaving them feeling like destroyed and horrible. And he, he like likes that about it. Like he feels so entitled to getting what he wants in the same way that Kylo and Anakin do that they feel like because they don't get what they want, that everyone should die they should all have to deal with like their righteous anger. And if anyone gets in the way, then it's their fault for getting in their way. And it's not their fault. They have to, they're forced to kill them. It's kind of funny. Like I I talk about like Star Wars villains, that their villains are always a direct like mirror of whatever is like the scariest thing in our society at whenever those movies come out. But in a very similar way, like somebody like Luke is is like somebody that like runs rampant in our society right now like somebody who's like conventionally attractive and good looking is like has a lot of connections with a lot of people and so they're able to like get by and get out of situations that maybe they shouldn't have been able to get out of do they have like a tragic or like traumatic backstory have they been through traumatic things did their childhood suck yes that's true but that doesn't mean that they get to do the things that they do when they're older but they do and they tend to get away with it for many many years because people just look at them and they think that they must be a nice person because they're just like whatever reason people have this like predisposition to think that if you're conventionally attractive then that means that you're a nice person and so somebody like luke who is doing those things but is using the fact that he's like was seen as like an easygoing like kind of nice guy who was easy to get along with and knew how to talk to people, was like an extroverted person. Somebody doing that but using it to be evil is... I see people like that on social media all the time. (laughs) Like Shia LaBeouf or whatever is very much that story of somebody who is a monster and he just goes away for a couple years and people just are wanting to like welcome him back when he hasn't done anything to show that he's actually changed at all because there's no way that he has. He just like went away for a couple years. Perfect kind of villain for this age group, right? Because of the grooming aspect, because that is literally the type of people that like this, this group of teenagers, particularly this like 13 year old where they're semi going through puberty, trying to find themselves. They are more likely to fall victim to somebody like that, telling them who they should become or how they can become that way. 
Um, Especially like when you think about with like the grooming aspect with Luke, like in the last chapter, um, Selena is the is his mole and she's the one telling him what's going on at camp. And she was just this nice girl that was like teaching Percy how to drive, how to fly a Pegasus, right? You would never think that she was doing that, but he's telling her at this time that she needs to tell him what's going on at camp because if she does, less kids will die. Meanwhile, he is on this ship literally saying they're all gonna be dead in a month, so I don't care. Mm -hmm. And it's just like that aggressive juxtaposition of what he is saying, what he is saying to the people that he's trying to groom versus what he is actually doing. It's like, like you said, it's those moments with those characters and those in like those kind of horror or like scary things where you realize like, oh my God, they're th th this like thing that they've been doing is just completely a facade. Um, it takes a while for them to figure out because they're literally children. Yeah. But things like this happen all the time. And Luke is a really good example of someone who gets away with stuff like that a lot still and it's good to remind them like just because they seem nice and they seem like a nice person doesn't mean that they actually are you gotta pay attention to how they actually make you feel and that's also why he's a perfect villain for this age group for like the you know the age group that the books are intended for um because they they wouldn't see it necessarily either and i mean you mentioned influencers that's where we're seeing it happen the most, where people are like, oh, I'm gonna buy all of their merch, I'm gonna support them, I'm gonna go to all their events, and then, <clears throat> then they get canceled, you know? Or something like that. I think that people, especially when the age group of like teenagers, you you don't, because of the age that you are, you don't want to believe that there's somebody like Luke that are doing the things that they're doing. I believe that Luke is doing these things because he's been manipulated by somebody else, because he's misguided, because he believes that what he's doing is right kind of thing. It's really hard, especially at that age, unless you've had some really bad life experiences, um, <coughs> to like grasp that he knows that what he is doing is like wrong. He just doesn't care about it. That's really hard for teenagers to like fully grasp is that sometimes people do know that they shouldn't be doing this and they just are doing it anyway. And so when people like that say like, oh, I'm sorry, accept it. And they want to believe it because they want to believe that somebody isn't that bad. Mm -hmm. But like some people really are that bad. You're not actually mature for your age. Anyone over the age of like 20, they even 20 year olds, they know they can tell that you are younger. When somebody says, when you say that, when you lie and say that like you're 16, but you're really 13, nobody who's actually 16 would ever think that you were actually 16 if you were at 13. Like nobody actually thinks that. You can tell when you're at those ages how young that person is. But like when somebody is a charming, nice person and is telling them, you know, oh, you're just like mature and cooler than every, all the other girls I know that are my age you just feel so horrible having to like ruin that kind of like facade for them. And I can't even blame them for not wanting to believe it. And like stories like this with somebody like Luke is a really good way to try to introduce that idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I really, I appreciate what Luke, Luke, not Luke. <laughs> I appreciate what Rick Riordan does with these stories because he doesn't like, he doesn't preach to you. He doesn't tell you what you should be believing. He kind of leaves it up to your interpretation and like leaves it up to for people to go for kids to go back and like rethink about things. So I think the only other thing we didn't cover yet was the Grover part of the dream, which is mm -hmm. just it's a combo of the Odyssey. So we have him doing the trick that Penelope did on the suitors with polyphemus again and literally watching him undo his own weaving and redo it at the same time mm -hmm. i mean he's probably lucky he probably learned how to weave at camp i'm guessing you know they probably teach a course in it um but i just i imagine him not even doing his best at the weaving he is doing because you know he's a polyphemus isn't gonna see it and b he's just doing it to pretend so yeah it's just I'm I'm just I'm laughing just like imagining Aryan filming these scenes. <laughs> oh my God. It's gonna be hilarious. That's the part I'm most looking forward to. 
Like, oh my god like every- it's gonna be like necessary very necessary like comedic stuff because everything else is so intense like luke is intense the stuff that happens with clarice and cersei's island and the backstory with with like luke and thalia when they were younger all that stuff is like very intense stuff and so having these like scenes like percy feels pressure he had to like save grover but these scenes are also just grover wearing a wedding dress like talking with like a high-pitched voice acting like he's a woman fooling like a ridiculous cyclops <laughs> it's just it's gonna be it's gonna be a nice break from all of the horrible other stuff that's going on i hope that and they put just... at least one of those per episode until we get to grover yeah and like arian is so like the behind the scenes videos of him filming that are going to be also worth everything that has ever happened in our lives. <laughs> like every struggle for the next year is going to be worth it to see behind the scenes videos of him when he's filming those scenes. Cause I'm like, who is, who is going to be playing like the voice for the Cyclops <laughs> and things like that. Is there going to be like, a, I'm just picturing like a behind the scenes person in like a, a weird like suit, like they wear just standing there and somebody else having to like be the voice or something. Cause that's just going to be so funny to film just, period even without seeing it on screen yeah oh my god but it's it's that's just gonna be so funny um and it's our it's definitely gonna be like Aryan's time to shine is like every episode is gonna be like this is all so intense but Aryan wears a wedding dress and like his comedic timing is just from his tiktoks alone is so funny and he's going to have probably the time of his life <laughs> filming those scenes yeah <laughs> gonna be the highlight of the season for sure (laughs) i'm just picturing like when they get to his island and them seeing him in that dress and just being like what's going on buddy (laughs) i I also do appreciate that percy being a 13 year old boy is like okay this is actually really funny but i can't laugh right now yeah it's like this is he's like i have to be serious though (laughs) like yes my best friend is wearing a wedding dress. I don't know what's going on here. This is very strange, but also he's like saying that he's going to die soon. So I can't make fun of him about this right now. But later on when this is over, there's yeah. going to be so many jokes about this that people are probably going to get tired of, of them hearing it. <laughs> on, on the series front, I guess the other thing we could kind of mention is all of the kids recently went to Disneyland and posted a bunch of pictures. But one of the people they included is not in the cast. And you were telling me a lot of people are fan casting her as Talia. Yeah, her name's, I believe her name's Danielle Jade, and she's a Black actress who lives in LA. She's friends with Leah, and so I've seen her before the last few months. Um, she has a TikTok account, and Leah's TikTok account can, like, never stay on here because pe- that's, like, the one thing people can do to her is get that account banned. So that's what they do. Um, but she'll like randomly show up on her friends, TikTok videos. And so she's uh, made videos with her before. And she's somebody that a lot of people have speculated for playing Thalia because um, since Lance Reddick is black um, and Zeus is her dad, that the person who plays Thalia should be like black, at least like mixed black. Um, considering that that's their dad in in like this version of the story and so she's already friends with all of them because she's been around them before since she's friends with Leah and like she's I've seen her in like videos and stuff with Charlie and Dior like doing things together um the last few months when they're not filming or anything so she's around all of them and so if she was able to get the part that would be kind of like the best case scenario probably because she already knows them all and so it wouldn't be there wouldn't really be a transition of bringing a new person into season three because thalia is such a huge part of season three yeah and so that would make it very easy for them all if she is able to get it and it just feels like being like 39 and like being part of fandom since i was 12 um I'm like, I feel like this might be one of those weird things where later on, after we find out she got the part, that we all look back at that and be like, oh, no fucking wonder (laughs) why she was there. Like, actors do stuff like that where they, like, do incognito things in front of everybody and get off and think that it's funny that we don't realize what's going on. Yeah, well, and I mean, the representation, too, is it really matters. I mean, 
typically the character is kind of like a rocker chick, right? She wears like a leather jacket and she's supposed to be badass. Like you don't see a lot of black female characters like that. Yeah, and ironically, um, a black woman is the one that like invented grunge music and like was the one that came out with like kind of like emo music or what is called like alt style now. And so they're the ones that started it, but they always get superseded over by white people who like co-opt it later on. Mm -hmm. And so it'd be really cool to see because Thalia is very much that person that like I, <laughs> I looked up the Sea of Monsters movie like I, I told you and watched it without the sound on because I don't hate myself that much. But uh, I saw like a picture of like when Thalia wakes up in that version in, in the Sea of Monsters movie. And when she wakes up, they have her wearing a leather jacket. <laughs> just like she just like woke up with one ready to go because like when they see like when they think of like an alt like 16 year old that's what they picture is somebody wearing a leather jacket she doesn't have to wear a leather jacket and she can still be like emo and things like that that's just but yeah it's very true that the other thing with besides her with casting Tyson was played by a, like an actually like autistic actor not like like somebody who's actually autistic. Usually autistic actors don't get that many parts um, and things like that. But it would be really cool if he could be played by somebody who actually was because he so much is um, very similar to how we act. And so it would, be, it would be a chance for them to have somebody who's at least openly disabled as playing a character that is also disabled. Like you never know with the other cast members, they could easily have a disability. They just don't want to tell anybody about and they don't have to. He is like, I feel like the, the, this shows at least best chance to have to, op to have somebody who is openly disabled and open about it and, and like work with him with that character, especially. Yeah. And it, whoever it is, I'm like, they, he has to be the first one that they're going to tell us about. Um, Cause he's obviously in the first episode. Yeah. And so everyone is pretty much just dying <laughs> to find out about him particularly. Um, but it would be cool to see Danielle as Dahlia. Is, but I just hope we'd see, I don't know how we, they wouldn't have flashbacks. That would yeah, be interesting have to include them. with Luke too. Um, next week will be like, I think the flashback things that Annabeth tells Percy about when he's like, why do you hate Cyclops so much. Can you please give me your backstory? Um, so he understands what's going on, but I'm sure that they would, and it's a good way to show how much Luke has changed mm -hmm. to show, or even give like clues about who he is to see how he was back then versus how he is now. Cause it's not like that stuff just like came out of nowhere. Some of that stuff was around during those years too. They just, you know, they just didn't realize it at the time. Well, yeah, because um, Annabeth would have been six, right? So she like definitely seven. wouldn't have seen it. And I mean, she probably won't even be the most reliable narrator of how it went down because of being seven years old. You know, like the, the rose colored glasses about who Luke was to her. Yeah. And that I that's what I appreciate about these series is that like everything is from Percy's perspective and a lot of the videos that I make on TikTok where people like will leave me comments and I'll say like, just because Percy, the traumatized child, like literal child, doesn't realize or doesn't think that somebody realizes that somebody is like using them doesn't mean that we as the audience should just accept that. Like just because he thinks that doesn't mean that we have to think that. Mm -hmm. And that's like a whole thing reading these books is like, and I, that's why I'm, I'm like really curious to see how they frame those like flashback scenes with Luke. Um, because I feel like us as the, it's one of those things that us as the audience of like watching this happen, will probably have a different feeling about that than Annabeth would when she's telling the story. And Percy will definitely feel different about it than Annabeth would when she is talking about her own memories. Cause it's just, you know, she was young and that's just how that stuff goes. Um, but it is a way for the audience to almost, it's, it's what I think is fun with these books is it, like how the characters in these books feel about people and then how, as the books go along, especially as the show goes along, how different the audience will probably feel like, especially in, at the, 
the stuff with Luke is just going to be really hard for people to justify, even just in this book, this next season alone. And so, like, even though we know what happens in the other books, like, we'll be like, okay, like, I get why Annabeth says that, but also, can somebody stab Luke? <laughs> I think is how this is going to go. Um, but that's like, that's why these being turned into a show is such a good decision because it gives you the chance to like flesh out the world so that people can realize those things in a way that is harder for kids, especially to recognize when they're just reading a book. Yeah, yeah. Rick, I mean, it happens in real life too. Rick wants us to see that <laughs> you can be manipulated without realizing it by having even Percy be manipulated and not realize it. And you're literally mm -hmm. reading his experience. So we'll read another couple, couple chapters for next time. And I'm still hoping we'll get news soon. <laughs> I mean, it's about to be summer break for these kids. So any day now we're going to get something. All of the information about filming, I'll, I'll say is August 1st is when they're going to start. And so I'm sure that like relatively soon they'll do like official announcements for at least Tyson since he's in the first episode. Whoever yeah. would be cast in like the first episode, they'll pro I'm I'm just guessing that they'll announce that stuff in like July at least because they usually do like a month of at least like a month of like pre-work before they start filming. Mm -hmm. And so they would probably announce it when that kind of stuff is going on. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll at least get it in July. And but if we get it before then, that would be super. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like they they have to be in some sort of pre-production right now. So they, yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that the like trio, you know, like Arian and Leah and Walker already are. Mm -hmm. um, the other kids like Charlie and Dior and stuff. I know that they're like getting ready. Like Dior posted something the other day about bulking up for for season two of Percy. And so I'm sure that it's not like they're not doing nothing. But I, I also think that the trio kids are pr the ones that go through the most training stuff, not only with like the script stuff, but just with like training with like water and all that kind of stuff that they have to do. And so I'm pretty sure that they are doing that right now. And it's just a matter of time where more of them are gonna like join them at a certain point. And the next chapter mentions the Confederate soldiers. And so it has to be then. Yeah, okay, all right. So we'll talk about that next week. And yeah, um, so I'll talk to you later though. Yeah. <laughs>